It's a difficult time, uncertain uh, time in many parts of uh, the world. You are, you know, an experienced diplomat. No doubt you have a profound appreciation of leadership roles. What's your assessment, sir, with regards to how the world is responding to this pandemic? Well, the first thing that I t uh, say is the, the obvious, and that is crisis management. Uh, this has been a failure of gargantuan uh, proportion. And if you look in the textbook uh, under Crisis Management 101, how we've had would be an example, a prime example of what not to do. Mm. In the face of a crisis, you don't want to create panic. Uh, you want to try to mitigate uh, panic. Uh, that's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make would uh, be a response to the, uh, uh, the the clip that aired just before our interview. And, and that is, we know that everyone is not uh, going to be in 19. Uh, we also know that a very small percentage of people in the world are going to die from COVID-19. Correct. We also know that all of the people who lose their jobs are going to be affected and their families are going to be affected. Uh, according to the uh, International Labor Organization, which is based in Geneva, they project that 25 million jobs as a result of this panic. Most of those jobs are going to disproportionately be lost in places like South Africa and other countries on the African continent. Uh, they project that uh, up to $3.4 billion will be lost in spending power. Mm -hmm. That's going to impact disproportionately countries like South Africa and countries across the continent. You know, when I arrived in South Africa about a month ago, the exchange rate was 15.4. Today, it's 17.4. Mm. Uh, that means that it's going to cost more for South Africa uh, to implement. It's going in terms of uh, debt repayment. Uh, it's right. uh, this is going to be uh, devastating, Look, and at some point we have to appreciate, or at least have to question: Are we reaching a point of diminishing returns? And by that, I mean, no, I, yes. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and no doubt economies around the world will be largely affected by COVID nineteen. And as you put it in the, your recent uh, opinion pieces, viruses have been a fact of life since time immemorial, but. There are new lessons that I guess we can learn after every pandemic, you would agree. What would some of these most salient lessons at this time? Well, the, the first new lesson is actually an old lesson. And that is uh, we've dealt with other coronaviruses. SARS was a virus. MERS was a coronavirus. Mm. And one of the things that we did not do was shut down the global economy. And there's a, a, a reason why, whether it's economically justifiable or not, the is one of the reasons we've been able to deal more effectively with viruses today over against uh, our ancestors in the past is because we're healthier, wealthier, and cleaner. And when I say wealthier, Oppenheimer or Rockefeller rich, I mean middle class. Middle class people eat better uh, because they eat better. They, uh, uh, they have uh, the, 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 the more nutrition because their diets are more nutritious. Their immune systems are stronger. And because their immune systems are strong, they're able to fight off viruses like COVID-19. Mm. How do you think uh, China has handled this uh, pandemic? It, it was, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 when we listened to President Donald Trump yesterday, he said that he wished China would have informed them earlier about what was happening inside the country. What do you, what do you think their response has been so far? Well, you know, the, uh, 
one of the things that we have to appreciate in this uh, uh, shame to have to say, but this pandemic is a Trump pandemic. I mean, the 31st of December was when the Chinese first uh, detected uh, this atypical pneumonia, uh, which we call COVID-19. Immediately contacted the World Health Organization, uh, as they should have done. And when the first death occurred, uh, I think it was around January the 11th, uh, the Chinese state media made that public. Uh, immediately after that, there was debate at the World Health Organization whether to declare this a global health emergency. They deferred until January the 30th. Mm. And when they declared the global health emergency, they made two points. The first of which is this was not a no-confidence vote against the Chinese. The second is that they were declaring uh, this global health emergency because of their concern about the coronavirus spreading to countries with weak health care systems. The United States would not, despite all of our, our, our issues around health care, certainly would not be categorized as a nation with a weak health care system. Immediately after, within hours after the global health uh, emergency was announced, contrary to uh, organization recommendation, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted that he uh, uh, the, the, the implementing a level four travel emergency. emergency. Mm. That's the panic button. He pushed the panic button. Uh, and so we've got to keep in mind that, that this is a Trump-generated gener panic. Once we put that in perspective, uh, I think it would behoove us to pay less attention to anything coming out of the Trump administration uh, and more attention to what common sense and what history tells us about how to deal with these sorts of things. Mm. What do you make of uh, the president of the United States calling this uh, the Chinese virus? What does that do in terms of stigmatization? Well, one, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, xenophobic, it's racist. But as bad as that is, the, 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 the thing that's uh, uh, most onerous is that one of the things that ought to cause everybody to go, aha, is given the fact that this virus is spread around the world, which is not unusual, uh, it should be clear to everybody that we're going to need to cooperate internationally to wrap our hands around the thing. Uh, we did that in the Obama uh, during the Obama administration. Ebola. Uh, that worked out pretty well. If you're engaged in name calling, uh, that is certainly not the best way to win friends or influence. Ambassador, we don't have a very good line to you, so I'm going to just wrap it up uh, with just this final question. You know, developing countries like, like South Africa have pretty much taken measures that other countries uh, in the West uh, and Asia have taken. Such measures are meant to stop the spread of uh, COVID-19. It's meant to save lives. But do you worry about the long-term effects of such actions on the economies of countries, in particular in Africa, some of which are really struggling financially? Well, not just the long-term consequences. I worry about the short and medium-term consequences as well. You know, most of the folks on the continent are employed in lower-income jobs. These folks can't, they can't lose one paycheck or two paychecks or three paychecks or paychecks and not have it have profound consequences. You know, the number of homeless people this thing is going to increase significantly. The number of hungry people uh, on the continent is going to increase uh, significantly. Uh, so uh, rather than falling lockstep uh, with the West uh, in terms of response to this thing, countries on the continent ought to call us back to uh, a point of common sense, uh, try to engage the world uh, in a sense of common purpose, in terms of uh, dealing
this, this issue yeah. and uh, look at ways to walk everybody back from the leg and get uh, back on track. All right, Ambassador, that's where we'll have to leave it. Thank you very much indeed for your perspective, as always. Appreciate it. Be well. Thank you, Blaine. Take care. All right, uh, that was uh, Charles Stith, uh, a former U.S. ambassador to Tanzania. He is also the, currently the non-executive board chair of uh, the African Presidential Leadership Center, which is a Johannesburg-based NGO. He also chairs uh, the African investment company Pula Group. We